Are you having difficulty finding Commodore monitors at reasonable prices? Well, so is everybody else, and that's why today on Basic Bytes, I'm giving you my tips on buying an LCD screen for your Commodore 64 on the cheap. Roll intro. <laughs> Welcome to Basic Bytes. I am your host, JC, and let me tell you, nothing parallels having an authentic Commodore monitor from the 1980s hooked up to your C64 or 128 for the overall retro computing experience. However, compared to the abundant availability of the computers themselves, those monitors are now relatively rare and relatively expensive, and if you do shell out for one, it doesn't come with any guarantees as to how long it's still going to operate until that decades-old piece of equipment encounters some sort of a fault. And if you aren't capable of repairing a CRT, which is not a trivial task, you could be investing in what may soon become a very expensive and very heavy paperweight. For these reasons, the majority of modern Commodore 64 users have quite reasonably invested instead in simple LCD screens for their retro computers, and these, of course, can work quite well. And it probably goes without saying that when you are seeking one out, what you are looking for is a full screen LCD, the 4 to 3 squarish aspect ratio that was in vogue for those sorts of panels in the mid to late 2000s or thereabouts. That's not one of today's tips, that's just common sense, because a Commodore 64 hooked up to a widescreen display either looks quite silly or just plain wrong. And of course, the other advantage to looking for LCDs from that era today is that uh, they are still quite plentiful, but uh, not desired by the average person who, for modern purposes, is now using widescreen displays. However, when seeking out an LCD for your Commodore 64, how do you get the most out of your purchase? Well, in this video, I'm going to give you my four tips as to what you are looking for when making your LCD purchase, which up until lately was actually my three tips. And when I get to number four, uh, that's going to explain what the heck this circuit board is doing sitting in front of me as a sight prop to fill the backdrop in today's video. Tip number one, you are looking for an LCD TV, as in television, not monitor. Uh, the reasons for this are numerous. First of all, if you go the monitor route being intended for PCs, all that monitor is going to give you is a VGA input, which means in order to connect your Commodore 64 to that monitor, you're also going to need to invest in an AV to VGA converter, which to get a quality one may end up costing you just as much as you paid for the old LCD and your mileage with it may vary. Also, of course, is the question of sound. The LCD monitor probably is not going to have any built-in speakers, and even if you do buy one of the rarer LCD models that did have integrated speakers, those speakers were generally a minimalist solution just to provide some sound from your PC. In comparison to that, an LCD TV not only has the inputs to directly connect your Commodore 64, but of course it also has built-in speakers and is a device that was constructed with the idea that it was meant to provide quality video and sound. Thus, whereas 
a monitor may, according to the prices I am seeing currently, run you, oh, anywhere in the $15 to $25 range, whereas the television was probably going to be in the $30 to $50 range, going the television route will alleviate you of all this extra equipment and cabling that is going to be necessary if you simply look for an old LCD monitor. Tip number two, you are looking for a 15-inch LCD TV specifically with the three most common sizes of small televisions having been 15-inch, 17-inch, and 19-inch. This is indeed a case where size does matter, but not a case where bigger is better. Simply, every Commodore monitor that was sold specifically for use with the Commodore 64 had an actual viewable area of 13 inches, meaning that if you go for the 15-inch LCD, you are seeing a picture that is perhaps slightly larger but still very close to what you would be seeing in size and scale on an authentic Commodore monitor. And, of course, it bears remembering that Increasing the size of the LCD does not in any way increase the resolution of the picture that you are seeing from the Commodore. Even the 15-inch LCD, which typically has an actual resolution of 1024 by 768, has well more resolution than the inside the borders area of the Commodore 64 screen, which is only 320 by 200. When you increase your LCD size, what happens is you simply take every pixel being outputted by the C64 and make that pixel larger. And in my experience, what happens when you go up to, say, the 19-inch LCD is that you have made all of the pixels so large that when you look at graphics and artwork that were designed for Commodore monitors, the increased size of the pixels doesn't even really allow your brain to process that image in the same manner as it would on the 13-inch Commodore display until you get up and stand several feet back. So certainly look for the 15-inch LCD television. Uh, the only way I would recommend going to something like a 19 is if you are using your C64 as strictly a gaming console and by default you plan to be sitting well back from the display with your controller, perhaps in old Nintendo style, because you grew up being traumatized by your parents yelling at you not to sit within six feet of the tube TV. Tip number three answers the question of what Inputs should you be looking for on the LCD TV given that the objective is to plug your Commodore 64 directly into it? Well, any LCD TV of the sort that we are discussing should have both composite and S-video inputs. And of course, in all cases, you want to ensure that you are using the S-video input because of your options available, that is by far your cleanest sharpest, best picture. However, the earliest of the Commodore 64s only support composite output. So if you do have one of those very early model Commodore 64s, you will have to use the composite input on that television. And for completeness, of course, I will also mention that because it's a television, it will have a coaxial cable input, which can be used if you wish to instead use the RF output from the RF modulator on your Commodore 64, and you will certainly wish to use the RF output if you are a complete and total masochist. Now, aside from that, the one other input that I strongly encourage you to look for in making this investment is a VGA input into the television. Many, but not all, LCD televisions from the general era in which this sort were made were also able to be used as a VGA computer monitor 
again if you go for the 15 inch about a 1024 by 768 display why is that important to you because you may at some point wish to buy or convert one of your Commodore 64s from a North American NTSC machine into a European PAL machine due to the many, many, many European game titles which do not run correctly on the North American model or at least don't run at the correct speed because our video is uh, 60 uh, fields per second and theirs is 50. In any case, there are only a small number of LCD televisions produced in North America that will directly accept a PAL input. They do exist. I actually happen to have one that will do both NTSC, aka 480i, as well as PAL, aka 576i, directly into the composite or S-video jacks, but that is a rarity. If you can find that, buy it. But for most televisions, if you do decide to invest in a European model Commodore 64 for gaming at any point in the future, your one option for plugging that into the television is going to be to buy a AV to VGA converter of the sort that was mentioned earlier in this video. So having the VGA input just ensures that you have that option if you should decide to expand into it. Oh, and while I'm on that topic, I will mention these are a lie. These lovely mini PAL to NTSC converters, which, you know, you put the composite input on one side and it comes out the other side and you can switch which way you want to convert, I have determined are a lie. I know this converter works, because I've hooked it up both to my authentic Commodore 64 monitors as well as my LCD TVs. And it does what it does when it's not getting a signal, which is it just outputs a lovely color bar pattern on the screen. So the converter works. However, I have not been able to get this thing to recognize an input signal from any one of my multiple Commodore 64s. So if you are seeing these PAL to NTSC converters everywhere and thinking, oh, well, if I have a PAL system in the future, I can just buy one of these cheaply and plug it into it. <laughs> no, good luck. As far as I'm concerned, your one option to get that working correctly on an NTSC display is the VGA converter, so check out that that input exists on the LCD TV that you're buying for your 64. And finally, tip number four, which I actually just added to my list this week based upon a personal experience with one of my own LCD televisions, and that is search for one that ideally has an external power supply. And all I mean by external power supply is one of these. You have a brick. If you don't have an external power brick and all you have is a power cord that plugs into the back of your LCD TV, what that means is that all of the power supply circuitry that is inside bricks like these is instead inside your LCD television in addition to all of the other components that need to be in there. Which brings me to this, which has been sitting here all video and which you probably now guessed. This is the internal power supply board from an LCD television that does not have an external power supply. It's one that has worked very well with Commodore 64s for me, but unfortunately, the panel has recently started to go dim. And LCDs going dim are very frequently caused by issues with the power supply and even more specifically, frequently caused by issues with the electrolytic capacitors on the power supply, which is these. These little cylindrical components that you see all over various 
circuit boards. And I have just now undertaken to replace all 10 electrolytic capacitors on this board. It was only about a $10 job. There's no great deal of cost there, but of course, a certain amount of know-how is needed in order to open equipment, uh, replace capacitors, and to do so safely. Because wherever the power supply is, that's where your high voltage is, and you don't want to be messing with that unless you know what you're doing. So, by moving from an internal power supply to an external brick, you do two things. First of all, you move one potential point of failure, which is the power supply, into something that if you have issues with, you can very easily replace in the future without ever having to open your LCD television. And the second thing that this does is it removes a source of heat from inside the television. And that's important for longevity because, of course, the more the heat, the faster electronics will die their eventual death. And of course, if you've ever wrapped your hand around a power brick after it's been on for some time, it also is quite shockingly warm. And in fact, looking at this power supply board right here, there are one, two, three rather substantial metal heat sinks on it to dissipate the various heat that is lost in voltage regulation. So you don't want to take the heat that has to be in the television and add yet another heat source for the electronics inside of it to bake. So the question then is, why really do we care about the decades-long longevity of these cheap LCD televisions that you know, cost under $50 and sometimes substantially so, it's not like it's an authentic Commodore monitor. Because, in my estimation, in 10 years from now, the Commodore monitors are going to be so rare and sought after that they're going to cost at least double what they're going for now. And the only reason why LCD televisions of the sort that work well with the Commodores are so inexpensive now is because they are not so old that they are no longer plentiful, but they are just old enough that the average person doesn't want them. So today it's an easy buy, but my recommendation is find two good 15-inch televisions that work with your Commodore 64 setup today and buy them because in 10 years, just due to sales, throwaway, recycling, breakdown, and people purging old electronics, you may find it's pretty hard to find a small full-screen LCD TV when you want one. So, by all means, ensure that if this is the way you are running your Commodore 64s, that you have this solution available well into the future. It is now the future, and this beautiful, bright blue welcoming screen is being brought to you by the Toshiba television that has been in surgery all video, and my personal favorite, the Commodore 64C. For those of you who are wondering, this is not the LCD television I mentioned that I have that will do both NTSC and PAL. That one is a black bezeled Philips model, which does have an external power brick and has an interesting lineage because Philips was actually one of the main makers of the glass CRT tubes that went inside many of the original Commodore monitors that were sold specifically for use with the Commodore 64 and 128. Other makers included Hitachi and Daewoo, but now, now we're getting well off the topic of this video. If you found it informative or entertaining, please like and subscribe to Basic Bytes for more. And if you have any LCD buying tips that you think I missed, please leave them in the comments for the benefit of your fellow C64 enthusiasts. Thank you for watching.